evening. Um, on behalf of Valerie, Dr. Uh, Pennenden, and myself, I uh, want to welcome you to the uh, initial forum of our fourth year of Chi-Met Revisited. Um, before we get to our um, talk this evening, I just want to mention there are some um, leaflets of uh, upcoming events that I have on the sign-in table. And um, and if, are there um, any other announcements from folks here? Nothing going on? Okay. Um, then I'll uh, continue on with this evening's speaker, and that's Dr. Kent Schoon. Uh, he's a Northwest Indiana native and Professor Emeritus of Science Education at IUN. He has a bachelor's degree in geology, a master's degree in secondary education, and a doctorate in curriculum and instruction. Um, and I've given this introduction several times over the past 10 years because at, at different events. Uh, so I should have it memorized, I guess. Uh, in 1990, after 22 years as a middle and high school teacher, he joined the faculty at Indiana University Northwest uh, and then retiring 23 years later. At the uh, 12, uh, 2012, you retired 2013. Uh, which time? <laughs> the uh, last time. Uh, 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 yes, I think. Yes. Dr. Schoon's uh, research interests center around science. Uh, misconceptions and uh, local studies. His newest book, Shifting Sands, is a companion to the uh, documentary, Shifting Sands. And uh, in fact, we had Lee Botts here what, two years ago um, when it was uh, just a big uh, project was just beginning. Uh, his newest book, um, or his earlier works include his 2003 Chimet Beginnings and his 2013 Dreams of Dune Land. Uh, Dr. Spoon is a founding board member and past president of the Dunes Learning Center, an advisor to the Shirley Heinz Land Trust, and a member of the Indiana University Northwest Science Olympiad Steering Conference Committee. I'm sorry. So uh, without further ado, uh, Dr. Uh, Spoon. Thank you. Um, um, Lee Botts was here, you said, a couple of years ago, Mike, right. and uh, she was talking about her project, Shifting Sands. Uh, there's a documentary that I just assisted on. I wasn't part of the, the official team. And it was finished, and we did our, uh, our premiere come on, on Earth Day of last year, and we were very pleased that the documentary has been shown by more than 76 public television stations across the country and that it was nominated for an Emmy. Um, and that has a lot to do with the people that Lee talked into uh, putting it together and uh, they did a really nice job. But Lee announced that since when Ken Burns did his talk on uh, excuse me, did his program on the national parks. He also had a companion book that went with it uh, for people who want to know a little bit more than what the, the documentary explained. And uh, so she wanted the same thing for her documentary. So she talked me into doing the, uh, uh, the, the companion book. Uh, I have from her uh, the documentary. How many people have seen Shifting Sands on Channel 11 or 56? Okay. Um, if any of you said, boy, I wish I had a copy of it, uh, I did get these from Channel 56, and they're $20 if you're interested. I don't, I sell them for, for Lee and for the company. But what my project was, uh, was the companion book, uh, which went with it. And when I do this talk, it's it's never the same as the documentary, otherwise I just put the documentary on and sit down and be quiet. <laughs> um, but let's turn off some lights. I can get them. That's here. That's There's still enough light and yeah. this yeah. is comfortable. So, um, I've lived in the Calumet region all of my life, 
And as a kid, I had no idea what what a fantastic and, and unique place it is. Uh, as an adult, I chose to live here. Uh, I particularly like where I live because, like many of you, I can be in downtown Chicago in 25 minutes. I can be in the Indiana Dunes, a national park, in 25 minutes. And where I am, I can go to the Red Barn um, in Lansing and get fresh produce that was picked that day. Uh, and it's a five or ten minute drive. So it's, a, it's a really neat location. But this Calumet area has more than just proximity to a big city. Uh, this Calumet area has great biodiversity, something I was totally unaware of as a kid. I went to high school in northwest Indiana, and nobody ever talked about this. Uh, it was something I learned later on, and yet I read a book um, that was, uh, well, it's The Wonder of the Dunes. Some of you may have seen it. Uh, it was written in the 1930s? No, no I'm take that back. Uh, in the 1950s and 60s. No, it wasn't. It was when the first, uh, the first efforts to start the National Park were. So it's closer to 1915 or 1920 that it was booked, that it was written. And it refers to 1,200 different species of plants that live in northwest Indiana. And uh, I didn't know that people knew that that long. Uh, but it also has great industry. Uh, people outside this area think more about this area as great industry than great biodiversity. That's the, the reputation it has outside the Calumet region. In fact, the New York Times recently ran an article about how great it is to go swimming in Gary. Yes, Gary, Indiana was in the, the headline, yes, Gary, Indiana. Uh, speaking of Marquette Park and what a beautiful beach it has, and wow, it's in Gary. Um, this area has had horrible pollution, enough so that the Grand Calumet River and the uh, Indiana Harbor Ship Canal were classified as the most polluted rivers in North America. Another distinction that we have, but it has had a remarkable recovery. And the problem is a lot of people are stuck on this. And that's why Lee said, we've got to do this project because people don't realize how much we have accomplished in the last 50 years. And so that's why we put together the documentary, which I strongly recommend for those of you who haven't seen it. Channel 56 shows it fairly regularly. That's Lakeshore Public Television. Now why? Why could it have both great diversity and be a perfect place for great industry? And that has a lot to do with my two favorite subjects geology and geography. Um, if you think of what Indiana looked like before European settlement, so that's well, Indiana's, you know, just celebrated its 200th anniversary, and by the way, this was, this is a project that was done as part of the bicentennial project, uh, project for the state. 250, 300 years ago, most of Indiana was heavily forested. When Abraham Lincoln's father came into Indiana. You you may have seen you know pictures of of that. Uh, all the families who came in. One of the most important tools they had was an axe. An axe you had to use to chop down trees so that you could use the lumber to build a house. So you could use the lumber to heat uh, your house, and so that you could clear ground and plant crops. The forest was there first. Ohio was forested, Pennsylvania was forested, New York was forested. Everything to the east was heavily forested, but not Illinois. Illinois is the prairie state. Now, th that doesn't say Illinois didn't have forests. I mean, we have the Cook County Forest Preserves uh, within a very short distance of, of this campus. But Illinois is largely prairie and Iowa and Nebraska and Kansas and South Dakota were not heavily forested. The Indiana Dunes area, and actually sort of the boundary line between Indiana and Illinois, uh, got a special name. It's called the Central Forest Grasslands Transition Ecoregion. Isn't that a wonderful name? <laughs> Central Forest Grasslands Transition Ecoregion. 
That means everywhere along here has plants that are both common to the forests and plants that are common to prairies, all growing within a short distance of each other. Lake County uh, had forested areas. Can you imagine Whiting and Hammond were the center of a timber trade uh, in the 1830s and 1840s and up to the 1850s? Then when all the trees were gone, the industry left. And uh, a lot of the lumberjacks moved north into Michigan. But why are the dunes and why is northwest Indiana special? And it's because we also have Arctic plants and we have desert plants, both growing close to each other. Arctic plants such as the tamarack tree that grows at Coles Bog, uh, Arctic plants such as the jack pine, uh, and desert plants like the prickly pear cactus. That cactus grows in every southwest U.S. desert, and it grows in the Indiana Dunes, not far from the Arctic plants, and it may be surrounded by grassland plants and forest plants, so it has plants from all four directions. Those two boundary lines intersect in one place, and that's basically the southern tip of Lake Michigan. Now, why would we have such great industry here? Uh, our biggest industry, of course, is steel making, but we don't have any iron ore in northwest Indiana. We don't have any limestone. In, well, we have the Thornton Quarry, but I'll tell you a secret. It may be the large, one of the largest limestone quarries in the world, but there's no limestone there. It never has been. It's a rock called dolomite, and it's not what uh, you use to make beautiful buildings like uh, the National Cathedral and the Board of a board of trade or the Empire State Building or other things that have been made from Indiana limestone. That's dolomite, but the rock industry calls it limestone. And there's no coal here. There's nothing here, except there's a lake. And that lake made it possible for all of that to coalesce at the southern end of that lake. It's possible for the coal to come up from the no south, from Ohio and southern Illinois and Indiana, and possible for the limestone to come down through Lake Michigan and meet at the southern end of the lake. And then you had the transportation from the railroads that could take the finished product anywhere you wanted. But the biggest customers early on were in Chicago. So we had great industry, but we've had a terrific or remarkable recovery from the industry and from the pollution that it created. Now before settlement, before any uh, of the Europeans, the Yankees came here, what was the ground like? Well, this picture is of a man named Harry Einigenberg. Harry was born in a log cabin not far, just on the Illinois side of the state line in the Calumet region. And the reason I can quote him is he wrote several books about what it was like when he was a kid. Um, he was born in 1859 in that log cabin. And he describes the Calumet region as the most beautiful country in the Middle West with all of its streams, high sand ridges, big trees, meadows, and marshes. Could that describe the area today? He went on to say the rivers and creeks, the sand dunes, the big trees, and the canebrake marshes provided for the settlers a choice home for everything they needed, nature had provided in great abundance. Wow. That's from a, a man who grew up here, was born here, grew up here, spent his entire life in the Calumet region. We have a lot of natural resources, not the kind that uh, the Spanish conquistadors were looking for uh, a couple hundred years earlier, but one of our resources was timber. Another was sand. You say sand a natural? Well, yeah, sand. Uh, it was a big industry in this area. Removal of, of sand. Clay, water, of course. Boy, the Southwest is very aware of how much water we have up here. <laughs> they would like to build a pipeline from here to Arizona. Or, in fact, the governor of New Mexico almost almost a, uh, proposed a pipeline from Wisconsin to New Mexico. Let's drain Lake Michigan, right? Um, ice. Now, ice is not considered a valuable mineral resource anymore, 
but it sure was in the days before the refrigeration. Farmland, wildlife, transportation routes around the southern end of Lake Michigan and the lake itself. So timber. Here's a picture. Uh, Archibald McKinley has this picture in his book on whiting, but he doesn't say the picture is in whiting. And I've not been able to fi figure out if it is or not. But in any case, here's a sled and horses draw pulling a large uh, mass of logs bound for wherever, wherever their customers were. And yet that's not a pioneer picture because you can see there are already buildings along the side of the road. Water was a major industry, a major resource. We don't export it. In fact, it's now illegal to export it in large quantities. Uh, back in the early days, uh, we had little water towers uh, like that one. Of course, those have been replaced by water towers that look like this now. But we have enough water, we use it for decorations, for pretty. And we have enough water next to the lake that we can sell it to communities farther south, uh, like Crown Point. Crown Point buys water from, I think, from the, the Hammond, San, uh, Hammond Water District. And uh, they store it here until they need it. But they can use it because their sewer water, after they treat it, goes north into Deep River, into the Calumet River, and into Lake Michigan. So the water is taken out of the lake and it goes back in when they're done. In Hammond, water, Hammond's, the city of Hammond can take as much water from Lake Michigan as it wants because the wastewater goes back into the lake. Well, it did originally. We've messed up with some of those routes since then. Sand was a major industry. Uh, there were huge sand dunes where uh, West Beach is today and where Bethlehem Steel is today. Uh, in fact, there were fairly small sand dunes where U.S. Steel and Gary is today. Clay was a, a major industry. We had bricks, brickyards made from the clay that was dropped here and left by the glaciers long before uh, any humans were living here. Uh, Hobart, Porter, Munster, and Lansing all had brickyards and uh, used the clay uh, from the ground in order to make those bricks. And ice. This, this photo is uh, after snowfall, uh, when Wolf Lake was frozen, and the first thing they had to do was shovel the snow off of Wolf Lake. Doesn't that sound funny? Uh, and then they would cut the ice, at first using hand saws and later power saws, and haul that ice to the shore and then sell it uh, in the city of Chicago. Uh, this is a man named uh, Gustav Lufgren. He was a Swedish immigrant. And here he is selling sand. That's, that's, that's Gustav. That's a block of ice on his shoulder. Uh, I couldn't lift it off the ground, let alone hold it on my shoulder. That man had to be pretty strong. And he's uh, selling it in the south side of Chicago. And he works for, you can read it just the beginning of the word, the Consumer Ice Company. Uh, the Consumer Ice Company and Knickerbocker uh, were two of the big uh, ice, ice and sand. You, you mine sand in the summertime, you mined or harvested ice in the wintertime. That, by the way, is my wife's grand, grandfather. <laughs> Wildlife. Today, if you find, find a raccoon in your backyard, it's a problem. If there are coyotes running in the uh, area, it's, it's a problem. Uh, opossums are problems. Um, but boy, 150 years ago, 200 years ago, the people came here for the wildlife. The Tolleston Gun Club was built just uh, just a little bit east of Hessville, uh, near the Little Calumet River. Uh, there were they had room for 60. Excuse me for not being sexist. It's just the truth. 60 men who would come out and go hunting on the weekend. And these weren't poor people. Their, the membership of the Tolleston Gun Club included C.D. Peacock, included Marshall Field, included the president and most of the board members of U.S. Steel. Uh, they particularly liked it because they could take the train out from Chicago on Friday night after work and be back there by Monday morning. Uh, transportation was a major advantage of this area. 
Uh, the Indian trails, uh, these black lines are Indian trails, and they went around the south end of Lake Michigan because you couldn't walk across the lake, even in the wintertime. And that's been replaced, of course, by railroads, which had to go south and around up to Chicago, and <coughs> interstate highways still come around. This area will benefit from its being on a major transportation route forever. It's, it's a natural advantage. And farmland. Uh, Lake County and Porter County have some of the best farmland in the area. Uh, because it's, it's nearer the lake, therefore the winter is not as severe as it is a little bit further south. And uh, this is, uh, anybody know what crop this man has? Onions. That's close. Onion seeds. If it was just onions, he wouldn't have every one of those plants go to seed. He was collecting the seeds which he sold to farmers in Dalton and Lansing and South Holland who then planted them and uh, grew onion sets which provided 97% of the onions in the United States. And so uh, this man uh, was providing the seeds for those other farmers. Um, it was my grandfather's first cousin, and I think he was indeed a man outstanding in his field, <laughs> at least on this day. Now, if you want to know what that area looks like today, it's the Jewel Osco parking lot at the corner of Calumet Avenue and Ridge Road. But uh, when I drive past Jewel, this is what I see in my mind. Well, of course, this area doesn't look like that anymore. Uh, some of this is good because uh, refrigeration and electricity has meant we don't need to buy ice boxes and keep them in our kitchens anymore, but you'd be surprised. No, you wouldn't. You know people who re refer to their refrigerator as an ice box. Development was a big thing here. Now, one of the first developers were these two men. Anybody in this room know who these two people are? Torrance was one. If I gave you the hint that it was Michigan City? Barker. 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 Uh, father and son, John Barker Sr. on the left and John Barker Jr. on the right. And uh, they created what was called the Haskell Barker Car Company uh, in Michigan City. Notice the smoke coming out of those smokestacks? That was a sign of progress and jobs and food on the table. Um, pollution was the price you paid for prosperity in those days. And the Barkers were among the first in the area to take advantage of of, of, of the location. Uh, they made cars, but those were railroad cars, and it was one of the largest railroad manufacturing cars in the country. Uh, but they did freight cars. Pullman did passenger cars in Chicago. Pullman, by the way, eventually bought that company. Hmm. Um, how many people recognize this one, this band? What city are we in? Hammond. You've just given his name. George Hammond. That's George. George Hammond. And uh, he founded the GH, or the George Hammond Company, which was sometimes just referred to as the State Line Slaughterhouse. Uh, he invented the refrigerated rail car, and he got a patent on it. And with that patent, he was the only manufacturer, the only butcher in the United States who could buy them or make them or use them without, I mean, other people could if they had his permission. Uh, then the patent runs out and everybody gets refrigerated cars. And he built his uh, plant right on the east side of the Indiana, Illinois line. Uh, where downtown Hammond is, drove through that area coming up here today, uh, just north of the, uh, well, he, he was right along the, the Calumet River. He used the water for drinking. He used the water for the ice that he could then harvest and put in his cars in the springtime and in the summertime. <laughs> and he used the Calumet River as a sewer. All of the waste went into the river. And uh, 
it, and as a result, most of the family members of the men who worked there refused to live in Hammond because the smell was so bad. The place burned down in 1900, and he didn't rebuild. Well, he was dead by that point, but his company didn't rebuild. Okay, last question. Do you know these three men? You've seen three before. Not very famous. These, these names are a little more famous than the first three. Hmm. Now, the Barkers lived in northwest Indiana, and George Hammond didn't, but uh, he often came here, and his brother was mayor of the city of Hammond. Um, but these men never lived in northwest Indiana, but boy, did they know the advantage of being here and uh, what you could, you know, the money you could make by investing in northwest Indiana. Is the one on the left Charles Schwab? Is who? Schwab. U.S. Nope. Steel. John D. Rockefeller. Rockefeller. Yeah. Yeah. Albert Gary in the middle, and Henry Ford on the right. Yeah, of course. All of these, all three of these men invested heavily in this Calumet region. Uh, Rockefeller, of course, is well known uh, for Standard Oil, and in 1889 he, uh, well, no, it was a little after that, but 1889 is when he established his refinery in Whiting. He made the cover of Time Magazine, so, you know, he was a national figure. George Hammond never got on the cover of Time Magazine. <laughs> Albert Gary, of course, uh, the city of Gary is named after him. Uh, he started the U.S. Steel plant there in 1906, and uh, Mr. Gary ended up on the cover of Time Magazine. And Henry Ford, we say Henry Ford stuff is in Michigan. Not all of it, of course. Many of you are familiar with uh, what he has in South Chicago, uh, but he was also going to go into airplanes in a big way. Uh, having successfully uh, launched the automobile, he was going to do airplanes as well. Um, he started, of course, his Ford Motor Company in Michigan, but in 1926, he bought land in South Munster and Lansing, uh, built the hangar for his air, built an airport. Uh, the hangar still uh, stands. It's now on the National Register of Historic Places, and he was going to make airplanes here. But 1926 was not a great year to make long-term plans. <laughs> and the Depression did him in, and he dropped all the plans. And when the airplane business really did take off, it was a West Coast business. And Henry Ford, of course, ended up on the cover of Time magazine. So what do we have with those three people? We have steel making. We have customers. Uh, it, because Henry Ford was one of the biggest customers of the steel making, and we had a, we had a refinery that was making kerosene, which very quickly changed its product to gasoline so that they could fuel these cars that uh, were running on steel made in northwest Indiana and in South Chicago. And the, this was the product of all three men and their businesses. The net effect on the air quality in Northwest Indiana was really bad. There were no rules about pollution. Uh, even as late as the 1950s, Congress was setting standards. But no the law that said you had to meet the standard. It's just that this would be nice if you did. Uh, this is where the DuPont Company is today on the Grand Calumet River. It was then the, uh, I can't read that. Cresselli. Cre yeah, Cresselli. There's uh, a street in East Chicago, Cresselli. Uh, this is a postcard of Standard Oil in white. <laughs> so this is, this is what they sold, and people would, you know, then write their letters to neighbors and send it off. And so, the, you know, the smoke was not a problem. You didn't say, oh dear, we don't want the smoke today. If, if there was no smoke coming out of there, you would assume that the plant had closed. That effect on air quality wasn't good, of course. Uh, that effect on water 
was worse because at least the wind would blow the air pollution away and people downwind would suffer from it. Uh, sometimes down, people downstream suffered, but a lot of that pollutant s settled down to the bottom of the river and stayed there for well over a hundred years. In 1967, a Chicago Tribune reporter put his hand into the Indiana Harbor ship canal and brought it out and his buddy took the photo and this appeared on the front page of the Chicago Tribune. Trying to show people in this area how bad it was. Why did Chicago care? Because we were polluting the source of their drinking water. The Grand Calumet River and Indiana Harbor Ship Canal, as I already noted, were named the most polluted in North America. Well, why is our book and the, the uh, documentary, why are they, titled Shifting Sands? Well, on the beach and on the sand dunes, the sand shifts. But what was remarkable about this area is the shifting attitudes of people about pollution and dirt and filth and health and things of that sort. For a long time, if there was empty land, the goal was to develop it. What do you, if, you, if you're living in a, in a neighborhood and there's a, a lot next to your house and there's enough, nothing built on that lot, what do you call that lot? You call it empty. Em is empty a positive term or a negative term? <coughs> It's generally negative. It's, you could say it's neutral, but really, um, if I went shopping and I came home with an empty bag, you know, uh, that's, that's not considered positive. In Chicago, any of you from Chicago? Okay, you, you tell, tell me if you heard this as well. My wife grew up in South Chicago, and she said that empty lot next door was not called an empty lot. It was called a prairie. Mm -hmm. You heard that? Yeah. yeah. The prairie is a natural term. It used to be a prairie. What it is is the remnant of the prairie that is still there, uh, which is a fairly positive term. But the attitude of people in the late or mid 1800s of uh, the beginning of the 20th century was development. And people began to realize we're losing a lot of our most scenic places, we should do something to save them. And in 1908, the Prairie Club, uh, which already was in existence, uh, took advantage of the brand new electric railroad that went from Chicago to South Bend, uh, today called the South Shore, and it was, it was built, finished in 1908, and in 1908 they took their first hike in the dunes. Everybody taking the train out from Chicago, three hundred participants of the Prairie Club coming out for their first hike. This isn't the first one. Uh, this picture was taken a number of years later. Uh, 1916, last year, excuse me, last year, 2016, uh, was the centennial of the National Park Service. Uh, National Park Service wasn't the first group to start thinking about this. The Cook County Forest Preserves uh, were formed by people who realized we need to set some land aside so you can get away from the city and enjoy nature. And the National Park Service began in 1916, so it celebrated its centennial last year. Indiana's state parks celebrated their centennial last year as the state was celebrating its bicentennial. Not a coincidence. To celebrate the centennial, they established the, net, the state park system as a sort of a gift to future generations, which we've been able to benefit from. The first state park was McCormick's Creek. So if you've ever been to McCormick's Creek, which was the first, no, second state park I was ever at, Dune State Park was the first. Uh, you've been in a hundred year old park. And here is the entrance. Well, in 1916, the National Park Service started, as I said, but there were no parks east of the Mississippi River. But the director lived in Chicago, and the director was a member of the Prairie Club, and he had been hiking out in the dunes. So he said, 
we need national parks east of the Mississippi, and I have a suggestion. And he proposed the Dunes National Park. That's Ms. Stephen Mather, uh, who was the director of the national parks, and he's walking with Richard Lieber, who became the first director of the Indiana State Park System, and a whole bunch of people going on a, on a hike. Um, but their efforts fell to World War I. Uh, the war started, uh, the government had other things to deal with, not caring any more about national parks. So, no national park going to be here. Bess Sheehan was the president of the Gary Women's Club. She was elected president of the Indiana Association of Clubs, Women's Clubs, and she decided the dunes had to become a state park. If it wasn't going to become a national park, it had to be a state park. And she lobbied every one of the, the state legislators, and her newsletter that went to most of the active women in the state of Indiana, because club membership was a lot bigger then than it is today, uh, and told them, gave them the names of their legislators and talked to them. All the late legislators were on, and I'm sure they were enthralled by all of these women who came and said, we have to have a state park up in the dunes. You know, this is 10 years after the state park system started. And she was successful in Indiana Dunes State Park opened. But it was immediately too crowded. <laughs> right, look, look at that beach. And that's from, uh, I don't think that's a 19, no, that's not a 1926 picture. That's probably a 1940s picture. But anyway, uh, all these cars stopped because there was no room for them in the park. And even today, on hot summer weekends, uh, they will, when the parking lots are full, they s close the entrance and cars line up double thick on Route 49. And as a car leaves, one car is allowed inside. And as another car leaves, another car comes inside. The park was too small. It was too small from the beginning. So in 1952, Dorothy Buell talked to Mrs. Sheehan and uh, got some ideas from her, and she founded the Save the Dunes Council, which went to work, again, with all women at first, but it soon became a uh, bi-gender organization, and they had formidable opponents in the, uh, the form of... Uh, George Nelson, who was the, the uh, chair of the, uh, the manager of the Valparaiso and Porter County Chamber of Commerce, they didn't want to park in Porter County. I mean, after all, Lake County was getting all this tax money from U.S. Steel and from Inland Steel and from Youngstown Steel and from Standard Oil and named the heavy industries in Porter County that were providing tax money. Now, they wanted industry. And uh, so it was a 14-year battle uh, but in 1966, Congress finally uh, gave way and approved the Port of Indiana. Uh, at the same time, it approved, with Senator Paul Douglas's help, the Indiana Dunes National Lakeshore. And the two were side by side. Uh, and in fact, it's actually the, the port and then the, the uh, uh, park goes almost around it. Senator Paul Douglas helped because the Indiana Senators kind of supported the idea of having more steel mills. And uh, Senator Paul Douglas uh, uh, achieved not only a park that had natural features, but also that had historic features. And so the, the Bailey Homestead, uh, which was the first, the first settlement of, I can't say Yankees coming from the East because he was French Canadian. Uh, but uh, but U European Americans who came in and settled in this area. And that's his house that he built in the 1830s. And uh, this is the Shelberg Farm, uh, which is just uh, a short walk away from there. So there's a historical uh, emphasis to the, to the National Park as well as a natural one. And Senator Paul Douglas got his picture on Time Mag Magazine at one point as well. But in spite of all those conservation efforts, the point, uh, the waters were still polluted, very polluted, with signs like this that said, unsafe, don't swim. So attitudes had to shift again. 
we had a shift from pollution meaning prosperity to pollution means poor health. And a remarkable change. I mean, people wanted those parks, yes. They were content to keep the pollution in the city, but they wanted a park so they could get away from the city occasionally. Um, but the attitude that one shouldn't have to leave the city in order to breathe clean air was a fairly new idea. Uh, and But science was showing people how bad water causes cholera and a lot of illnesses, and air pollution causes asthma and other respiratory diseases. 1962, uh, Rachel Carson came out with her book, Silent Spring. Now, there's a lot of criticism of the book, but I don't think anybody will argue with the fact that it was an awakening for the American people. Uh, her, I, her thesis was that we're polluting the air and water so much that the birds are dying, and therefore we're no longer going to hear the birds in the springtime. And 1962, I mean, there are still basically no laws against polluting rivers and polluting the air. Uh, pe people complained about air pollution, you build a taller smokestack. Then the s pollution goes out away from the people who live nearby, and it pollutes someplace far, far enough away and they don't know where the pollution came from anyway. Uh, just about that time, I used to watch a television program called That Was the Week That Was. Uh, anybody remember, anybody old enough to remember that program? And one of the uh, composers who wrote songs for that program was a man named Tom Lehrer. And Tom uh, wrote a, a song called Pollution in the 1960s. Again, there are no rules about pollution. And I just thought that maybe you might like to hear it. American City. Let's see you if I start that over again. Okay. You visit American City, you will find it very pretty. Just two things of which you must beware. Don't drink the water and don't breathe the air. Illusion. <laughs> I got smog and sewage and mud. <laughs> Turn on your tap and get hot and cold running crud. See the Hollywoods and the sturgeons being wiped out by detergents. Fish gotta swim and birds gotta fly. But they don't last long if they try. Pollution, pollution, you can use the latest toothpaste. And then rinse your mouth with industrial waste. <laughs> Just go out for a breath of air, and you'll be ready for Medicare. The city streets are really quite a thrill. If the hoods don't get you, the monoxide will. Pollution, pollution, wear a gas mask and a veil. Then you can breathe, as long as you don't inhale. Lots of things there that you can drink, but stay away from the kitchen sink. The breakfast garbage that you throw into the bay. They drink at lunch in San Jose. So go to the city, see the crazy people there, like limes to the slaughter. They're drinking the water and breathing the air. <clears throat> so there are three people from Northwest Indiana who made a big difference in national policy. Uh, so, so we're polluted, so we cleaned it up. Is, how much of that is to be proud of? Well, I'm very, very proud of the fact that there were three people from this area who made such an important difference. Do you recognize this man? Now we're talking about our lifetime now, not Frank Borman. 
Yeah. This is Frank Borman. Uh, you know his name if you drive the expressway very often. Uh, Frank Borman, by the way, was uh, named for his grandfather, Frank Borman, lived in Gary, uh, the Tolleston neighborhood. Uh, grandson of, of Tolleston. Actually, I should have written this as B-O-R-M-A-N-N, -N, because it was the German spelling which they got rid of during World War I, because there were anti-German feelings at the time. But he was an, uh, a NASA astronaut, commander of the Apollo 8 uh, mission, which was the first manned spaceship that went to the moon. It didn't land, it just orbited and came back. But he took the first picture of the Earth from the moon. Um, he did make the cover of Time magazine, by the way. This is the last <laughs> time I'm going to show this. But he's one of three. On his, he had to share the honor with the other two uh, men on his trip. You seen this picture? Well, Frank Borman's responsible for this picture. He didn't take it. He took the first picture, but he had black and white film in his camera. And NASA was very picky as to what the astronauts would be doing minute by minute. And they had enough film to do certain things. And he said to, the, to Buzz Aldrin, Get your camera out. Take this, take this picture with your color film, uh, even though it wasn't scheduled. So uh, it was basically a Northwest Indiana native who was who ordered that this picture be taken. But he did take the first one. I've never seen the first one. And uh, when Life magazine came out with a hundred photographs that changed the world, it was this picture that was on the cover. Ten times bigger than any of the others. Lee Botts is another one of those people. Uh, when I knew her, she was living in Gary. She's now living in uh, Illinois uh, in a retirement home, closer to her family. Uh, but Lee Botts in 1970 uh, formed, in the living room of her house, the Lake Michigan Federation. Uh, which had people from Michigan, Wisconsin, Illinois, and Indiana who cared about the health of the lake. And uh, they have uh, expanded since then to become the Alliance for the Great Lakes, all five of the Great Lakes. And the, when the federal government wants information about the, about the Great Lakes or what's good or what's bad, it's the Alliance they go to for information. <clears throat> and in 1996, two years before the Dunes Learning Center opened, she basically, again, in the living room of her home, uh, organized the group that would create the Dunes Learning Center where children, and, and just about every Hammond elementary school sends their kids for three days out to the dunes. Now, people have been doing field trips to the dunes for generations, but there's only so much you can learn when you get on a bus in the morning, you out, go out to the dunes, you go on a hike, led by some ranger back on the bus, and you're back again home by the time the buses take the kids home. Uh, what we do at the Dunes Learning Center is bring them out for three days. And they live there, they sleep there. For some of these kids, it's the first time away from home overnight. And for some of them, it's the first time they've ever seen darkness because their homes and their neighborhoods are never dark you know, because of street lights and things of that sort. And uh, we have, since 1998, served more than 100,000 students in these three-day adventures. Linton Keith Caldwell is the third person from this area. He wasn't born here, but he grew up in Hammond. His father was superintendent of schools of the Hammond system. A Caldwell Elementary School is named for his father. Um, he became an IU professor. By the way, he wanted to be a teacher, uh, so he went to school and got, and I know Alan, you'd love this. Uh, he, he was prepared to be a, a, a classroom teacher. He taught middle school, <coughs> found it just, it was too much. So he got transferred to a high school for his second year, and then he quit and went back to college so he could teach professor, so he could be a professor at the university, because it was easier. <laughs> Uh, I mean, middle school students were just not yes, his forte. Yes, interesting. Uh, it, takes a, with, yes. it, it takes a certain Very kind of personnel, doesn't it, yes. to teach middle school? Yes, they are. And it wasn't Linton Keith Caldwell. But for us, we're kind of glad that he did, 
because as an IU professor, he was called upon to write the National Policy for the Environment in 1968, which Scoop Jackson, a senator from Washington, then incorporated in the next year into the National Environmental Policy Act, which was the first environmental law on this planet that said you can do, it's the responsibility of the government to ensure clean air and clean water for all of its citizens. Why is it the responsibility of the government? Think of Northwest Indiana. The city of Gary did not like the air pollution and the water pollution from U.S. Steel. And they, want, they passed an ordinance at one point saying you've got to clean it up. And the superintendent of the mill said we can't afford to do that because Inland's not going to in East Chicago. We can't compete with them if they don't have the rule and we do. And so Gary never enforced the rule. Uh, and if the state government decided, okay, all the mills on Lake Michigan have to be good and no longer pollute the air and pollute the water, well, then the mills in South Chicago or the mills in Ohio, in Youngstown, or in Pittsburgh will, will get those customers because they can make the steel cheaper because they don't have to worry about pollution. It required national acts so that everybody has to go by the same rules. And it was Linton Caldwell who made sure that that would happen. And he was the author. And he did two things that were just, now we take them for granted. When there's going to be a big project, there must be public input. You must have public hearings. And every question that is asked by a member of the public must be answered. And all of their statements and the answers must go into the report. What kind of report? An environmental impact statement, which was created by that law as well. And so right now, Hammond and Munster, uh, and Dyer, but particularly Hammond and Munster, are concerned about the next major project, which will be an extension of the South Shore, which will go through both communities. There have been public meetings all along the way. Public meetings in Dyer, public meetings in Hammond, public meetings in Munster. And all the, the, the big wigs have to show up. They have to explain, they put out maps, they say this is what we're intending to do. And uh, people can like it or don't like it, and they can make comments. Um, it doesn't say that if you, it's not mob rule, the, the people at the public hearings don't make the rules because they don't necessarily represent all the community. But their voices must be heard and an environmental impact statement must be made. In other words, you've got to think of the consequences before you build not react to them afterwards. Okay, and I'm going to have to finish this up real quickly. Uh, the 1970s were, you know, this was after Tom Lehrer. Tom Lehrer sang that song in the 60s before any of this happened, and you could joke about pollution, but it was a serious matter. In 1970, the Clean Air Act, Nixon started the EPA. The Clean Water Act was uh, two years later, uh, and then late, lakes, the Great Lakes, the word great is missing there, the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreements with Canada and Coastal Zone Management Act all changed the way we deal with air and water. Uh, locally, we had a grassroots organizations such as the Grand Calumet Task Force that was an education and uh, an organization that pushed legislators to pass laws to uh, clean up the Grand Canyon River. And finally, just uh, a decade ago, that cleanup began. Uh, and th this is a dredge that's pumping up the dirt. We've already made rules saying you can't put polluted water into the lake, but there was already pollution at the bottom of the river. And that stayed there. And the water that flowed over it would pick some of that up, especially during storms. And uh, so it was still very dangerous. The fish still did not live in the Grand Canyon River. There were no fish living in that river. Uh, and just a few years ago, uh, the Indian Harbor Ship Canal began to be dredged. Where to put the sediment you're picking up is, is a matter of concern today. Uh, there have been articles uh, from uh, people in East Chicago who don't like the, 
the sediment being kept as close as it is to their homes. Restoration is finally underway. And this salmon was photographed at the sewage treatment plant in Hammond just about two years ago uh, by one of the employees. Salmon now go up the Calumet River to the Hammond uh, sewage treatment plant where the warm water comes off. It's a little warmer and the salmon like it there. And they spawn in the Grand Calumet River. Uh, wetland plants are being restored along the areas. Uh, <coughs> Pollution like that now looks like this. Same land. Same land. Uh, this is the DuPont property. This is the Grand Calumet River. This is a great egret that graced us on my last trip there uh, and came for lunch. In other words, to go fishing in the Grand Calumet River. Hmm. So we've had Shifting attitudes for a long time, industry was against environmental rules, and now industry has been one of the strongest supporters of environmental rules. Since the 1990s, the attitude has changed from let government do it to we all can do it. Sustainability is a goal that people have, that park departments have, and individual uh, companies uh, may think of retention basins or uh, things of that sort. Some wonderful examples locally are Hammond's Lost Marsh Golf Course, which was a slag heap beforehand. Uh, this was a brickyard in Munster. I already mentioned that they made bricks. Well, they took the bricks out of the ground, which made a big hole in the ground, which was used for garbage dumps and things of that sort. The brick company went broke, and that's now Centennial Park. The ugliest strip mine in Lake County has become a destination park. Destination? Yes. Whoops. Uh, people go to Centennial Park to have pictures taken after their wedding. <clears throat> That's my boy. <laughs> <laughs> um, and part of Centennial Park is a garbage dump, no, sanitary landfill, and the methane coming off the decaying garbage is used by these generators to make electricity which was going to provide electricity for all the street lights in town for about 20 or 30 years till they figured it would run out. Turns out that wasn't terribly practical, so it's sold to NIPSCO. Uh, and so some of the electricity running this plant, this, this projector, is from the garbage that was dumped at the old brickyard uh, a couple decades ago. Munster Steel Company, in the same general area, needed to <clears throat> move because they wanted to develop that land for hotels and condos and stuff. And instead of moving south to virgin farmland, they came north to Hammond. And uh, actually, uh, Mayor McDermott wanted them to change the name of the company from Munster Steel to Hammond Steel. But the owner refused. He said, my customers won't know who I am. Uh, and so they're, they're now not far from, actually they're pretty close to Central High School in East Chicago, uh, but they're on the Hammond side of the line. Uh, our restoration includes Gibson Woods Nature Preserve, which uh, was saved from uh, development at the north end of Hessville. Uh, IU Northwest has now a nature preserve on the north side of campus. The Shirley Hines Land Trust has in Lake Porter and LaPorte County purchased with private money more than 2,000 acres which they have restored to its natural condition. Uh, Arcelor Middle uh, now works with the uh, Wildlife Council, Wildlife Habitat Council, uh, for open areas around its steel mills. The Hoosier Prairie in Highland and Cherville uh, started out as a small project and it has uh, increased in size, and uh, a private citizen just gave the uh, county, gave the county or the state, I don't know who, uh, she provided enough money for an endowment so that the Hoosier Prairie will be cared for properly forever, mm -hmm. uh, just because she wanted to. Um, Right along the Grand Calumet River are a whole bunch of nature preserves. 
That's Gibson Woods. This is the Ivanhoe property owned by the Nature <coughs> Conservancy. This is Shirley Hines' property. So is this. Uh, this is DuPont's property, which they have set aside as a nature easement. Um, it's kind of amazing. That's what it looks like today. And wildflowers growing right next to the river that used to be a terribly polluted area in the city of Hammond. And there's my favorite, the uh, <laughs> egret. And I've run nine minutes over so, uh, thank you so much. Right. We have much to be proud of uh, in Northwest Indiana. No, however, don't ever assume that the project, the, the work is over. Uh, it's not, there's more to do, uh, but it's, uh, but we have made great progress. Questions? We must have questions. I have a question. Yes. Was this whole kind of environmental movement started by people just tired of all the pollution and so forth? Wasn't it a grassroots movement? All was. Um, it all started with grassroots. Started. Government had to, industry had to, because people were getting disgusted. Scoop Jackson was a senator that helped, that sponsored the Environmental Protection Act, right. but he only did so because grassroots organizations were saying this has to be done. And in this area, the National Park was finally achieved because of the efforts of the Save the Dunes Council. NIPSCO wanted to put in a nuclear power plant right next to Coles Bog. Um, and it was a private group of citizens who got up and lobbied and argued and uh, actually got all the reports from NIPSCO, read them thoroughly, and found out where all the engineering errors were and made them public. And NIPSCO, by the way, ended up not building that nuclear power plant because it was going to cost too much. Not that it was going to be dangerous or something like that. It was purely a financial when the board, its board of directors said, we're not going to do it. Today, you can't find a single NIPSCO employee or administrator who thinks that was a bad decision. They are mm -hmm. grateful that they aren't saddled with a nuclear power plant. Can the uh, Ice Age it, it form the dunes, and then did it come up all the way to Ridgeville? Ice Age did not for, form the dunes. Okay, tell Ice me. Age formed the glaciers, which created the Valparaiso Moraine okay. south of here. And then the lake extended all the way to the moraine, which was where Teebles is okay. on US 30. Next time you have dinner at Teebles, think of that as a lakeside restaurant. <laughs> um, and US 30 was the beach. And if you stand in on the parking lot and look, you can see where the beach was and the ground slopes down to Lake Michigan, which is where Strachan Van Hills and Walmart and all are down low uh, below uh, the lake level. And then later, about a couple thousand years later, and that was 14,000 years ago, about 12,000 years ago, the beach was at Lake uh, Ridge Road and okay. uh, formed, formed that shoreline with the sand dunes south of the beach there. And then later, so many years later, formed a new beach where about 169th Street through Hammond in the Hessville area, the Michigan City Road going diagonally up into Illinois uh, would have been the Tolleston Beach. And then slowly from there, the lake level dropped down to where it is today. Thank you. And if you want to know more about that. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, if anybody is interested in either of the book or the DVD, I, uh, I, I brought them along. Uh, the DVDs are 20 and the book is $30. And uh, the book says a lot more than I can in 57 minutes. <laughs> so. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Our next meeting is uh, first Tuesday of September. And October. October. Of October, I'm, I'm sorry, of October. And um, so we'll see That's everybody right. so then at, at this way 5 not p.m. Use it. What will the topic? Yeah. Pardon? What will the topic be? Yeah, um, I do know, it's I do. going to be a, a preview of an upcoming uh, meeting on the uh, Wolf Lake watershed. And um, I will be the speaker.
Uh, and we have uh, the entire year, uh, uh, the speakers listed for the entire year. I think everybody probably got that. Uh, but if you didn't, let me know and I'll just email it out to everybody. Um, but I want to thank you for coming. And um, we'll see you a month from um, and I'll be home on time. And you'll be here. Okay. And you'll be home on time. <laughs>